Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Welcome to this uh, webcast, Tax Talks, uh, where we have a few topics and some news we would like to drive you through. Uh, so be very much welcome. Uh, we're in Paris, it's cold outside, but warm here. I have a number of colleagues I will introduce in a second. You can see here the usual address if you want to tweet, if you want to send us questions. We will have 15 minutes at the end of this one hour webcast to take the questions. Introduction. We start with the uh, introduction of my colleagues. I think you know Dr. Pros. Uh, he hasn't <laughs> missed many of these webcasts and he's with me uh, to share what he's doing on harmful tax practices and a few other BEPS implementation things. Uh, Sophie Chatel, um, uh, I think it's her second or third maybe webcast, um, will also uh, share news on the implementation of the multilateral instrument. Sandra Knappen, uh, already participated to the webcast and she will update you on mutual agreement procedures and we have two new uh, participants. It's their first participation uh, to the webcast. Anne Moore and Tibor Hanapi are both from the uh, Tax Policy and Statistics Division. Uh, very good economists uh, working on corporate income tax statistics, among others, and they will brief you on this publication that we released a few weeks ago. Uh, I think it's important in the context of all the discussion on BEPS, the impact and the consequences, that uh, they can share some data, because we're now reaching the point where we're able to use data uh, which could help uh, inform the debate. Topics of the day. Unsurprisingly, given the release which happened earlier today, 11 a.m. French time, that was four hours ago, tax and digitalization. Uh, we have issued a uh, two-pager, uh, which is almost uh, or about two pages long for once, uh, and this policy note was adopted by the inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. Uh, we had 95 delegations uh, last week, countries represented, uh, a uh, few were missing, as the total membership is 127 members, but the paper was endorsed by the full membership of the inclusive framework. I think that's quite a milestone, and uh, it may be worth driving you through it, uh, and you may have a number of questions. Uh, you may have already seen in different countries some papers written about that, um, so uh, we'll try to give you some uh, insight on this paper. Then we'll move to the BEPS implementation, because when we are working on tax and digitalization, we are also working on the implementation of BEPS. There are many links between uh, both and uh, pretty good progress made on BEPS implementation uh, where you will be briefed. And finally, uh, we'll spend 10 minutes on corporate uh, tax statistics uh, to see what the main findings are and we'll end up with a 15 minutes uh, session on uh, Q&As. Tax and digitalization. You know that we make a case not to talk about tax and digital or digital tax because we strongly believe, uh, as uh, demonstrated in the conclusions of the Action 1 report produced in November 15, uh, that uh, it's not a uh, digital is not uh, per se a sector which could be easy to identify, but we should talk about the digitalization of the economy. A few dates uh, to have in mind when we talk about that. The, the first one is the delivery of the BEPS Action 1 report, which was about the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. Uh, this report was delivered uh, in October, November 2015, presented to the uh, leaders of the G20. You may remember the four main conclusions. One was, it's not digital, but digitalization. Two was, BEPS is exacerbated, so we will have to take stock by the end of 2020 on the impact the BEPS measures on uh, uh, this uh, uh, challenge of the digitalization of the economy. Um, the third conclusion was about VAT. VAT was not collected on digital services, so we introduced new regulations, new rules to ensure that, the, that there would be VAT collected in the destination country. We now have more than 100 countries which have implemented. Money is being collected by governments, three billion in Europe, maybe more in other countries, and that's something which was important. And fourth, 
and probably the most important or the most conflictual, the fact that on corporate income tax, there was no agreement on the way forward. Some countries said we need to change the rules to be able to tax profits, even though there would be no physical activities deployed on the territory and there were different options uh, examined, while other countries said no, so we left it. Uh, without any clear conclusion, except that countries would do what they want and we would take stock of where we would be by the end of 2020. So that was the Action 1 report. And it's clear that uh, the absence of clear conclusion, which was not success, not to say it was a failure, has planted the seeds of uh, the interim measures, uh, short-term measures idea in the mind of many countries, while we have tried at the OECD to push for progress towards a long-term solution. We were helped in that attempt by the fact that uh, the German finance minister, chair of the G20 at that time, uh, Wolfgang Schäuble, in February 2017, mandated the OECD to do an interim report, which we produced in March uh, 2018, and we'll go back to the conclusions of that report. Since March 2018, we've had a couple of meetings of the uh, Task Force on the Digital Economy, which is the subsidiary body of the inclusive framework for BEPS implementation. The Task Force has 127 members uh, on an equal footing. So the Task Force met in July and then in December, um, and, and these meetings were extremely fruitful with a number of ideas being brought to the table by member countries and then further explored. And what you have today, which is released today in January 2019, is a policy note agreed by the whole inclusive framework, which draws on these different proposals which have been made and tries to establish, if not yet a work plan, at least a sense of direction of where we are moving uh, next. If we go back quickly to the March 2018 report, the focus at that time was on uh, the features of the digitalization of the economy. And there were three main features identified. Scale without mass, and I don't need to detail, you understand what this means. Higher reliance on IP, with many countries saying nothing really new there. And the role of users in value creation user participation, user contribution in uh, a number of business models, which was acknowledged as pretty new uh, and quite fundamental for a number of countries. Three groups of countries emerged from that discussion. The first group uh, of countries said, well, there is nothing absolutely new in this area. We should wait till the end of 2020, see the impact of BEPS, and then advise whether something is needed or not, but probably nothing is really needed. A second group of countries was more interested into the user contribution. There is something new there, and we should draw consequences from, from this uh, new concept of user contribution. You have companies sucking the data of users in exchange for a free service, contributing to a social network or having access to a search engine. And these companies are monetizing the data, the user contribution in the third country. And this should create rights to tax in the country where the users are. And, and therefore, we should adapt the international tax system to this new reality. The third idea, which was floated in uh, July uh, last year, uh, came from a number of countries, one big country, the United States of America, saying actually what's that, what is at stake there is much bigger than highly digitalized business models. It's a more fundamental issue of the way taxing rights are allocated across sectors, because we do not recognize, this country speaking, that there would be a digital sector or something which could be ring-fenced. In spite of this disagreement on what to do, there was agreement on let's work together and uh, let's explore this uh, further, as was reflected in the communique of the G20, uh, which was issued in March 2018 uh, under the presidency of Argentina. Since March, a lot of progress has been made. And progress has come from 
a free flow discussion among the members of the inclusive framework. So you can see uh, again the meetings which were held in July and in December 2018. And throughout these meetings, a number of ideas emerged coming from the countries. And we have tried to put these ideas into, into two main areas, two main pillars. Pillar one is about the issue of nexus. When do you start taxing a company in this new digitalized world where you may do business in a jurisdiction without having any physical presence, which would be characterized as a permanent establishment, but also profit allocation. So that's the first pillar, and we have three proposals which fit under this pillar. The second pillar is an idea which has been brought by Germany and France in particular, saying that we need to complete the BEPS work. Some of the challenges coming from the digitalization of the economy cannot be distinguished from the remaining BEPS challenges, and as a result, we should complete the work, finish the job, by introducing a minimum tax, which, by the way, already features in the US tax reform. You know it as guilty, so we should work on this idea. Four proposals uh, were made and uh, under these two pillars. So we'll try to drive you through these different proposals because they have been encapsulated in the policy note and uh, they will be the basis for us to establish a program of work that the inclusive framework will look at in May uh, and then which will be reported to the G20. We'll go back to the next steps in a few minutes. So if we go through the first proposal under Pillar 1, the user contribution. Here, the idea is to revise the existing rules on nexus and on profit allocation by reference to active user contribution. I've explained the idea, and uh, the idea is to be able to attract taxing rights on the territory where the active user base is located. This would apply to highly digitalized business models, mainly the business models uh, which are based on uh, advertisement in a third country, or the platform on the gig economy, because these platforms highly rely on the data which is provided by the users. This would recognize the value created by the users of the digital uh, services. The second approach has some commonalities with the first one in terms of, well, we need at some point uh, to split the profit of companies. But here, the approach which is called a marketing intangible approach, is much broader. It's about saying it's not the users uh, which really create the value. It's actually the fact that uh, in a company, when you do business, you create value or you uh, make profits through engineering your product, marketing your project, product, selling your product. And in that approach, there should be a recognition for the marketing intangible, which belongs to the market. And as a result, when implementing both the nexus and the transfer pricing rules, there should be recognition of the value created by the marketing intangible. There should be a taxing right belonging to the market jurisdiction. And this is a, a very large, broad proposal which uh, would address all the uh, digital companies, if you want, but much beyond the digital companies, the more traditional uh, companies. A third proposal was made uh, some years ago and, and quite recently at the same time. Some years ago because it's grounded in the Action 1 report of 2015, the idea of significant economic presence. There should be a nexus where there is a certain degree of sales in a jurisdiction, where there is some elements of connection that should be recognized through a new nexus, which should result as well into a new allocation of taxing right. 
More recently, and you can recognize an idea which has been supported by India, but has now been joined by a number of other countries, developing countries in particular, but also Colombia, which is joining the OECD currently. The idea here is to say, well, yes, we need to recognize more right to tax to the market jurisdiction, which will address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy. But this should be done in a manner which is not too sophisticated, because if it is too sophisticated, a significant number of the members of the inclusive framework will just not be in a position to implement because they won't <coughs> have the capacity to understand or to implement the pretty sophisticated rules related to a marketing intangible approach and as a result we would have something simpler to implement and simpler to administer. If we move to the fourth proposal, which is about uh, Pillar 2, uh, it's a kind of a guilty or an approach which would say we need to address the ongoing challenges related to profit shifting, which arise due to the fact that you can still locate profit in a low tax jurisdiction. So the idea here would be to provide both the residence country and the source country a right to tax back profits subject to a low or very low level of taxation, even though this would need uh, to be uh, decided and to be uh, clarified what the level of tax would uh, trigger the implementation of uh, these rules. These rules being both an income inclusion rule, like guilty, where you top up the difference between the effective tax rate and the average rate, or a full inclusion, uh, but you would also have, uh, for inbound investment, a tax on base eroding payments, uh, which would deduct, uh, which would reject the deductibility of payments when these payments go to a very low uh, tax uh, jurisdiction, with some coordination rule to mitigate the risk of double uh, taxation. So many parameters still to be refined, uh, to be identified, but that's the philosophy of uh, this proposal. So. Four proposals were made, regrouped under two pillars, and the inclusive framework at its meeting last week decided to explore them and decided what to do with them. And that's what you can see in the policy note which was uh, released uh, earlier today. What we can take out of this policy note is one, that there is agreement to examine the proposals involving the two pillars. There is no agreement on any of the proposals, and there is no agreement that there would be a need of the two pillars coming together. But still, there is agreement without prejudice to explore all the proposals because they are the ones which may support a consensus-based solution. You can see, of course, that this discussion is pretty fundamental and that countries are nervous. They cannot agree upfront on a solution that they don't master the full consequences of. That's why they say, let's explore that. Let's try to reduce the gaps between the different uh, measures. Let's try to breach uh, uh, them as much as we can. Let's try to better understand them. But yes, that's the sense of direction which will drive us to a consensus-based solution that all our governments are calling uh, for. The second main feature, which is related to Pillar 1, is on the new rules of allocating profits. You can see that uh, there is a convergence in the fact that there is more allocation of taxing rights to the market jurisdiction or to the jurisdiction where you have the users. So you have a change of balance. But there is also something that uh, the OECD never touched before uh, because the member countries did not want to touch it. And now there is consensus on, yes, the working hypothesis on these three proposals under Pillar 1 is to go beyond the arms length principle. Not, the, not that the arms length principle is trashed. I think there is recognition that it's extremely useful for most of the transactions. But on the residual profit, on the big chunk of profit, what should be the rule? The three proposals explore or will explore new methods which may go beyond the arms length uh, principle. Of course, uh, there is also the recognition as a matter of principle that this should not result in taxation where there is no economic profit, nor should they result in double taxation. And there is nervousness, 
rightfully, nervousness that this should not result uh, in a system where companies would be taxed twice on their profit. There is consensus on this. There is not a single country saying, oh, this is my proposal and we don't mind about uh, whether there is double taxation or not. And a number of countries uh, insist on tax certainty. Uh, I could quote China, for instance, which I think is very interesting, to say we need to be very careful that we design a solution which will eliminate double taxation and which will provide tax certainty. So consensus on this uh, point as well, uh, uh, with also improvement of the dispute resolution mechanisms. The conclusions uh, are about uh, the mandate uh, to the uh, OECD uh, to elaborate a detailed program of work uh, that the inclusive framework will be invited to agree at its meeting in May. The next meeting of the inclusive framework plenary session will be the last week of May. Just on time to provide a report uh, to the G20 finance ministers who will be meeting, uh, on, I think it's on the uh, 8th and 9th of June in Fukuoka. Uh, so the idea is to refine the approaches, try to bridge whatever can be bridged, to be able to explore what would be needed to further elaborate these different proposals so that countries can take the hard decision, this works, this doesn't work, this could lead us to consensus, so that in the following 18 months, or between now and the end of 2020, we could refine the approach and facilitate the emergence of consensus on each of the two pillars, of the two pillars combined. But I think the political imperative, which has been fixed to the OECD by the G20 and much beyond the G20, by the OECD membership, the inclusive framework membership, is to find a solution. And we now have all the elements, all the proposals, which should allow us to find a proposal. So if we look at the next steps in the coming months, you will see that we will be quite busy. And we will start with a public consultation. This issue is an issue of concern for everybody. Business, civil society, governments. So we will start with the release of a public consultation document by the 11, 12th of February, which will give three weeks for all the stakeholders to comment and to send us written comments at the OECD. And then we will hold a public consultation. I think it's on the between the 12th and the 14th of March, it's that week of March, in Paris we will hold a public consultation meeting where we will draw on the comments received and where we will have a conversation between the members of the Task Force on the Digital Economy and all uh, those who would have uh, commented. Based on the public consultation, based on the work that the Secretariat will be doing under the supervision of the steering group of the Inclusive Framework, which includes 24 countries, we will feed the Inclusive Framework with a program of work, a detailed program of work between May and the end of 2020. And the idea here is not to explore just the solutions, but develop them so that at the end of 2020, there would be, hopefully, one solution agreed by consensus which would have all the elements ready to use for governments to change the rules so that they can address the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy and possibly beyond depending on the solution uh, which will have been agreed by then. In June, as I told you, the, G the G20 will be informed by the Secretary General of the deliberations of the inclusive framework in its May meeting. So that's where we are today. Pretty important milestone, I think, which is released. And for the tax geeks, I suppose there are a number of tax geeks uh, watching us today. You can see that the language in the policy note is quite new and quite fundamental. Of course, no agreement yet on the substance, but agreement to, working to, get to work together, commitment to working together so that we can reduce the differences and come up with a unified long-term solution by the end of 2020. That's going to be difficult, but it is feasible, and I think we have demonstrated throughout the management of the BEPS project that we could deliver big things in a short period of time. It's bigger, 
It's shorter in terms of timing, but it's still uh, feasible and definitely uh, very exciting. But while doing that, we are also making sure that the BEPS measures be implemented, because that's where you have some fundamental changes happening in the behavior of businesses, the behavior of tax administration, and taking stock of the progress made on the BEPS implementation, I think is extremely important, and that's where I turn to Akim for him to brief you on uh, the update on the BEPS implementation. Akim. <clears throat> Thank you, Pascal. Yes, over to big things, as Pascal says, things where we have actually delivered that makes you optimistic about our ability to deliver also in digital. I think they always say about past performance is no guarantee, but at least we do have some precedent here, I think, that we can look at. So I will first take you, if the clicker works, it does, to harmful tax practices and where we are. And this takes you from the future, the not so distant future, but still to the future, to the present. It's extremely present because we have released the 2018 progress report today on where we are on harmful tax practices. We did this very quickly. It includes results of decisions we only took in the second week of January, and then it was approved when the inclusive framework met. It discussed, of course, primarily the question of digital, but also went into the FHTP and where we are. As a brief recap, what is harmful tax practices? Harmful tax practices is trying to create an environment in which there is tax competition, there is no problem with tax competition, but there is sustainable tax competition, which means it is not based on a lack of exchange, it is not based on a lack of transparency, it is not based on regimes that only affect the neighbor but not yourself, and it is also not based on things that have no substance. So that's the essence, and as you can see here on the second bullet point, we have now reviewed a total of 255 regime around the world, 70 jurisdiction, to make sure that we have a level playing field and what a small country does, a big country has to do, and what a country in Africa does, the country in Europe do as well. So we do have a global level playing field, so we don't move it from one country to another, but we address the issue. Um, that's the aggregated view, 255 regimes from 70 jurisdictions since the start of the BEPS project. The new results, the ones that we took in December, is, as it says here, 80 decisions on 57 regimes from 19 jurisdictions. If you wonder how you can take 80 decisions on 57 regimes, good question. That's simply because some of these regimes are IP regimes and non-IP regimes, so technically that's two decisions. So where does this take us? And this is the overview. You can find this on the report. You can also find it on our website. So where are we? First of all, I think, and I would say that you might say, it is a statement of the willingness and the ability that once the countries that are now a large group of countries in the inclusive framework, more than 125, have taken a commitment, they implement that commitment. They take it extremely seriously, and as a result of this, you see the results that speak for themselves. So if you look across all of those jurisdictions where we are as of today, there is only two regimes that are actually harmful, and with respect to those two, that only relates to a grandfathering provision. So even those two going forward are clean, but there are some issues that some people are still in the regimes in a way that shouldn't have been. But that is an issue that with time will simply go away. We also have a small group of potentially harmful regimes. And again, you find the lists, you find the names, you find all of the information in the report and the website, which country, which regimes, how many and why. But even here on the potentially harmful, we see movement. It largely relates to grandfathering questions where countries are working to clean this up, even this small number. And the same is then true for potentially harmful, but not actually harmful regimes, which means technically it's a regime that violates the rule, but the economic effect is relatively insignificant, so there isn't really a risk um, for the international community. That does mean that if we step back that every one of the IP regimes that we had when we started the project has been changed, is now consistent with what we have agreed. If you look at the total number of legislative changes, if you just look at the process of being amended, not harmful amended, abolished, amended, out of scope, it's more than 125 pieces of legislation that needed to be changed. To be clear, to get to these results wasn't just something that we looked at and say it's not a problem, it's that the countries changed their rules, their laws, and made them consistent with what they had agreed to do. 
So that, I think, is, is where we are in a quick overview. And then maybe just taking you the last slide on FHTP, where next? One, we are going to start to review the no or nominal tax jurisdiction. Just very briefly, what is this? It basically is the extension of the substance requirement from regimes to countries that don't have a corporate income tax. And the logic here, again, is the level playing field. It says, if you need to have substance where you are a normal country with a low-rate regime, then it cannot be that you can just move that same thing to a jurisdiction that doesn't have a tax, and then you don't need substance. So basically, in a snapshot, wherever you go, substance will follow you wherever you are. It's something that you need to meet. Then, second, we will also um, do the review of the ongoing regimes, as we always have. Countries introduce regimes, new countries come in, existing countries introduce regimes. There's a lot of work. We still have 15 regimes that are in the process of being eliminated, but we will check whether countries also honor their commitments, subject to the timelines that have agreed. And there's another 28 regimes under review in the process. There's ongoing monitoring where we say, does it get bigger? As I said, you know, some not actually harmful, potentially. Does it grow? We monitor, we get economic indicators, we see whether we need to worry about it. And then, of course, there's an important aspect of transparency, the rulings exchange, where thousands of rulings have been exchanged, and that is being reviewed every year, and the third one is coming up the next year. So you can see that on FHTP, a busy schedule ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Akim. Impressive numbers indeed. Let me now turn to Action 6 peer review. Um, in Action 6, another very important milestone happened, uh, and you'll see published on our website in February the first peer review report on Action 6. The objective is to report on the compliance with Action 6 minimum standard the progress of countries in implementing their commitment to that minimum standard. Um, just a reminder, the Action 6 minimum standard has two main components. The first one is a statement that treaty cannot be used, really. It's not their object to be used to, um, to avoid taxation. So that's the preamble uh, that has been changed or will be changed in a lot of tax treaty to include that statement. The second element is the inclusion in tax treaties of an anti-treaty shopping rule. Well, it could take the form of uh, a, per, um, a principal purpose test, uh, which is a general anti-abuse, or something more detailed, which is called the limitation on benefits. So in a nutshell, this is the Action 6 minimum standard that country's jurisdiction has agreed to include in their tax treaties. The content of the report has two main uh, and very important parts. The first one is a look at the aggregate result of the nearly 2,000 tax treaties that have been reviewed in the context of Action 6 peer review. And what we find there is very important, and it's this. 65% of the treaties will, or will be changed by uh, an agreement and a signing of the MLI. And that is important because it shows that the uh, best or the preferred way for a jurisdiction to amend their tax treaties is through the MLI. Those that have choose the bilateral renegotiation of their treaties um, are later in showing any progress. So again, a big success of the MLI in implementing what jurisdiction has considered a minimum standard and important to do. The second part of the report shows each jurisdiction's progress towards the implementation of the minimum standard, and it includes 116 jurisdictions that were covered with that uh, 2018 peer review. Now, talking about the MLI, where are we now? Well, uh, after the signature of Papua New Guinea in uh, January, we now have 87 jurisdictions covered by uh, the MLI. What it means is a 1,500 match agreement. We still have 1,000 that are looking for a match, which hopefully will come as soon as countries are signing uh, the MLI. What we see in those match agreements is that all of them will include a principal purposes test. 
which is a very good and significant uh, development. But not the least, uh, there's also an update of uh, the Action 14 minimum standard in respect to treaties, and Sandra will, will go through that uh, minimum standard, but very good outcome of the MLI, in addition to uh, several countries that have opted for arbitration. Where are we in terms of ratification? Well, as of today, with Ireland having deposited its instrument of ratification, we are now uh, 19 jurisdictions that have ratified the uh, MLI, which will um, enter into effect in their due time, but already 47 agreement uh, for which the MLI have entered into effect on January 1st, 2019. We are waiting for additional ratification and we expect them to come in the uh, coming months. So this was the update on Action 6 peer review and the MLI, and I will turn back to Akim. Yes, thank you, Sophie. We'll give you more numbers. We'll move to a different uh, minimum standard. We move to Action 13, country by country reporting from tax administration to tax administration, as was globally agreed as part of BEPS Action 13. So just to give you a little bit of a sense where we are, what we do, what's happening, and what's going to happen next, and that's on the last slide. So snapshots on where we are today, you see it on the slide. Around 80 jurisdictions currently have their CBCR law in place. What we see is generally the law is in line with the minimum standard, and you will have seen through various announcements and updates that we do on our website uh, that where we identify that an issue, we try to work to address these inconsistencies quite quickly or so. We work with the countries with draft legislation. We try to get them to change where we indicate and where we see that there's a problem. Thank you also to business who alerts us where there are issues. Please continue to tell us where you see problems. You see them maybe sometimes earlier than we do. Very useful approach us, approach me, approach the team. Let us know where you see problems of inconsistency and we will try our best um, as hopefully we've done in the past to address it as much as we can. Um, we have about 7,000 CBC reports filed for 216. That's in line with our expectations. That also means that if you step back, by and large, all of those companies um, that were intended to be covered above the 750 that meet the requirements should be in the system, globally speaking. So that's a big step, as we've indicated. There's about 2,000 bilateral exchange relationships that have now been activated, including between the 75 signatories to the CBC Multilateral Competent Authority Agreement and a, and a number, a large number, an increasing number of bilateral agreements signed by the United States. The exchanges, while there were some glitches with respect to some countries, the technical transmission based on our agreed common transmission system are now working. They're working as extended. So the exchanges have also taken place. So then, of course, you wonder if you're a taxpayer and you're covered, like, what is happening next? Well, tax administration are now in the process of going through it, of running their models, of combining it with other information that we had, trying to make sense of it, working with it, combining it, and they will be using it, and you may have heard or you may have seen the consequences of the CBC filing. So that's a now thing that is happening. What do we do collectively at OECD? A number of things, uh, some of them you know, of course, we are working on a handbook which forms the basis in many countries of how you proceed as you think through the CBC. We also plan updates. We did it before there were the exchanges. Now we're thinking of bringing the tax administration together and doing another handbag, handbook that now has the benefit of exchanges having actually happened of the filing of CBC reports. So that's one work stream. We have a number of risk assessment workshops. Uh, thank you to uh, China STA that hosted one earlier, uh, earlier last year, in fact, um, in China, where we also brought together business, we brought together tax administrations to think through, to work through what it means and how you do the most effective use of the information, what it means, and importantly, also what it doesn't mean. And then just to mention the last two, we have a comparative risk assessment initiative, which not just limited to, but inclusive of the CBCR reporting, is thinking through, we have the same transfer pricing rules, we have similar risks, we've resulted in more standardization through the BEPS process, can we also perhaps better understand and potentially converge, have more synergy and standardization in the risk assessment process that we apply to what is increasingly a standardized set of data? And then, of course, and that would go way beyond the time that I have, there's the ICAP pilot of a multilateral approach to risk assessment and assurance, which in significant part builds on 
the CBC and has grown out of this. Um, so, so more of that in a while, not now. So then the last point, I guess, on what next in the CBC space. Um, as you know, there is a 2020 review. Thank you again for BIAC also for having made a contribution on the sorts of issues that we look at. Again, any further suggestion, let us know the sorts of things that you th see are not working that you think we should be thinking through. Um, we will have further discussions. The first question here where we are is for us to identify the key issues for consultation based on the experience of tax administrations that they now have, based on the experiences of businesses that have completed its stakeholders. Some of the things you can see on the slide, given the time, I'm not going to go through them in any detail. There's questions around scope. There's questions around content. There's issues related to local filing. There's some other issues where people are suggesting making the master file a minimum standard, further standardization. Some worry that perhaps certain things that shouldn't be in the CBC find themselves in the master file. So there's issues that need to be thought through. Um, we plan to have a public consultation on a draft that we produce by late 2019, 2020. And just as a general word, we are conscious of the fact that companies have built system based on what we have. And so we will need to be reasonable in the changes that we make and take all of those factors into account. I think that's the last slide on CBC and it goes to Sandra for an update on MAP. Thank you, Achim. So, where are we in, in BAP section 14? Um, as you can see, some good news, some less good news. Um, everything is going fine, I would say. Um, the MAP statistics give some encouraging numbers. We also see some improvements in guidance and in um, uh, additional resources for the MAP functions, which was really necessary. Um, if I can highlight two things for you, um, you see that 20% of the cases resolved are resolved via unilateral relief, which is good because it shows that MAP is working like it should be working. That means that the competent authority that receives a MAP request first looks itself whether it can resolve it, and it does. So it works in 20% of the cases, which is good news. But it also shows that 20% of the cases that go to MAP are perhaps cases that should never have gone to MAP if there would have not been such a taxation. So it's good news for MAP, but there's still uh, things that could go better. 80% um, of full resolution for transfer pricing cases is, I think, really a good news. But I, I should also say that on a positive side, 80% is a full resolution. That does not mean on a negative side that 20% has not been resolved because the other 20%, there might be very legitimate reasons for denying access or for having an objection not justified. So we can't deduct from this that 20% MAP did not work. So I, I think that um, for competent authorities, what they did is a lot more than only uh, achieving a result in 80%. Now, um, we also know that there's still a lot of work to do, and, and some of the work, if I can highlight some of the points there on, on the slide, um, um, some countries will need to take actions to change policy, practice, legislation to be compliant with the minimum standard. Um, we also see a 40% increase of cases started, which means that even the countries that are doing good for the moment will need to monitor whether they will have enough resources to be able to follow up with this big increase of, of cases started so that they will be able to resolve their cases within 24 months. And we also identified some issues that will not have been um, addressed by the actual uh, current minimum standard. So we know that some things could still improve in the future. Now, if I can show you some, some numbers, you, you see here on the left side the top 10 jurisdictions with a number of MAP cases. And, and as you can see, only three of them have um, decreased their inventory in 2017 compared to 2016. So for seven out of the, the 10, they have an increase of their inventory, which shows that there is still a lot of work to do to get less uh, cases at the end of the year. Now, on the right side, you can see uh, the speediest jurisdictions that had more than 100 cases to resolve in 2017. And then on the other side, good is that five out of these uh, jurisdictions that uh, are below 24 months are jurisdictions that are in the top 10 on the left. So 
with a lot of cases in inventory and a lot of cases being resolved, as you can see the numbers of the jurisdictions. So many of them resolved many cases in an acceptable period of time. And, and with that, I, I will limit myself to telling you a little bit about what we're going to do this year. So at this moment, we are doing uh, two things. Uh, well, we are doing more, but um, batch five um, has been uh, approved and will be published very soon, uh, next month. Um, in the March meeting, we will be discussing not only batch six, uh, but we also started stage two monitoring. And for batch one, this has been going on and we'll be, we will already be discussing uh, stage two for batch one in the March meeting. So we are started with uh, stage two now, together with the completion of stage one for the last batches. Batch seven started very recently and we will uh, continue working on that. And then mid-February we will ask input for taxpayers uh, for batch eight. And then of course, uh, in, uh, by the end of May, we will get the statistics for 2018 that then will be published a little bit later on in the year. And as more and more years uh, go by uh, with the new map statistics reporting framework, we will get more and more interesting information from the statistics in the future. And will that, I'll give the word to Anne. Thank you. Um, so now I'll move to something a little different, which is um, our new corporate tax statistics database. Um, we recently released it in on January 15th. Oh, sorry, and um, um, the database is available online, and um, we also have um, a, a company in brochure available in English and French, which describes the data and some of the key insights that can be gleaned from it. Um, the publication of this new database was a recommendation of the BEPS Action 11 final report which noted that a lack of quality information on corporate tax was a limitation in measuring the scale of BEPS and um, the impact of um, the BEPS project. Um, so in this new database, we bring together a range of data sources relevant to corporate taxation, um, including data on corporate tax revenues, rates, um, and incentives. And overall in the database, we have information on around 100 jurisdictions. Um, there are a, a few key insights that we've um, drawn from the database. One is that corporate tax revenues um, remain a key source of revenues for governments, and this is especially the case in developing countries. Um, we also see that statutory corporate income tax rates, or CIT rates, have been falling over recent decades but that headline statutory rates only tell part of the story, which is why it's extremely important to also take into account other aspects of um, corporate tax systems when looking at um, the tax rates firms face and the economic incentives that creates. Um, I'll go through now in a little more detail some of the data that's contained in the database. Um, in this graph, we can see corporate tax revenues as a percentage of total tax for the um, 88 jurisdictions for which we have revenue data. Um, in general, corporate, corporate tax is a significant revenue source for countries. Um, there is some variation that can be caused by differences in statutory tax rates in the breadth of the corporate income tax base and in the amount of revenues raised through um, non-corporate taxation. Um, corporate tax um, is particularly important for developing countries. Um, in 2016, um, corporate tax revenues made up a little over 15% of total tax revenues on average in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean, while um, it made up about 9% of tax revenues on average across the OECD countries. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In this next slide, we can see um, information on statutory corporate tax rates for the 94 jurisdictions. Um, for which we have um, tax rate data available. Um, and here we can see that statutory tax rates um, vary considerably across jurisdictions. Um, about um, half the jurisdictions in our sample have rates between 20 and 30%, but the full range goes from zero to um, over 40%. 
Um, despite the variation that we, that we see among jurisdictions, when we look at trends of average rates over time, um, we do notice a definite decline. So when we take the average of all the jurisdictions in our sample, um, we see a decline of about eight percentage points from 2000 in 2018, so from 32% in 2000 to 24% in 2018. And in this case, we're excluding any jurisdictions with zero um, percent tax rates. In this graph, we can also see um, statutory CIT rates by region. So we look at Africa, Asia, and Latin America and the Caribbean. And we also look at um, OECD countries. And in all these cases, we also see um, declines in statutory tax rates over the last few decades. Um, so, so this decline isn't something that's happened um, in certain countries. It's something that we see um, all over the world. And now I'll turn things over to Tibor to um, take you to the rest of the database. Thank you, Anne. So, um, so far we've heard something about uh, CRT revenues and rates, but uh, statutory rates tell only part of the story because they do not take into account variation in the definition of corporate tax basis. Corporate tax basis vary across jurisdictions due to a whole range of different provisions, such as, for instance, those related to um, fiscal depreciation or other allowances and deductions. Corporate Tax Statistics Database, therefore, also provides some additional information to give um, some um, additional comparable information on these aspects of the corporate tax base. What you see in this graph here are forward-looking effective average tax rates, and um, they are compared to statutory tax rates in 2017, so that's before the U.S. tax reform. And um, they include the effects of uh, fiscal depreciation, as well as allowances for corporate equity and several other country-specific allowances and deductions. And you can see we've ranked the countries from the lowest rates on the left to the highest on the right. And here it's important to distinguish between um, fiscal deceleration and acceleration. In the case of deceleration, the effective average tax rate is higher than the statutory rate. And this effect is shown by the light blue shaded bars or parts of the bar. On the other hand, in cases where there is fiscal acceleration, um, the statutory rate is above the EATR, and this difference is then shown in the transparent um, elements of the, of the bars. And uh, if you look now at the graph, you can see that most countries provide some degree of acceleration, and then this can be quite significant for some of the countries in the sample, like, for instance, the United States, where the effective average tax rate was 4.8 percentage points below the statutory rate in 2017. In India, it was 3.8 percentage points below the statutory rate, for instance. So these effects, taking those into account, can, can change the ranking of the countries and give you indications about the competitive position of each of the countries. The second aspect that we're looking at are um, expenditure-based R&D tax incentives. And here we, we see them in the graph together with direct funding for um, <clears throat> excuse me, business expenditure on R&D. And both are given as percentage of GDP for the year 2016. And there are two insights emerging from this graph. The first is that overall total government support has uh, increased. So this includes the tax incentives as well as um, direct government uh, funding, and you can see that by looking at the blue diamonds and comparing them to the stacked bars. The second um, insight that, are, that comes out of the graph is that uh, there is a significant amount of, co of countries that um, m uses um, comparatively um, generous tax support compared to direct funding, and this you can see by comparing um, the light blue and the dark blue parts of the, of the bars. And this taken as a whole over the entire sample means that tax support for business, and exp business expenditures on R&D has increased from 36% 36, 36 of the total government support to 46% over this 10-year period. Another element that we've already heard about are um, intellectual property or IP regime, and those reduce also the tax burden. As we've heard from Akim, um, the uh, Forum on Harmful Tax Practices is reviewing the regime to determine their status. And what we've looked here in, in the corporate tax statistics database is to take a closer look at those regimes that have, to, have been found to be non-harmful as of November 2018, and to look at the tax rate that would otherwise apply outside of the regime and compare these rates to the tax rate that applies under the IP regime. And here you can see that um, the regimes offer a considerable amount of um, 
of uh, reductions, ranging from around 30%, for instance, in the canton of Niedwalden in Switzerland, up to 100% in Hungary, San Marino, or Turkey. So these are significant reductions. And um, just to, to wrap up, um, current coverage for the first three elements in the database, revenue, statutory rates, and forward-looking effective tax rates, we cover respectively 88, 94, and 74 jurisdictions, and we're working to expand the coverage to as many inclusive framework members as possible. For the income-based and the expenditure-based R&D tax incentives, we're also working to expand coverage together with colleagues at OECD, and we're planning to incorporate those provisions into the forward-looking effective tax rates. And the last point that's interesting on this slide um, are the country-by-country -country reporting statistics, which I can assure you we're working on at the moment to collect and prepare the data, which will then be published as part of the second edition of corporate tax statistic. So stay tuned. And um, with this, I give it back to Pascal. Thanks a lot, Tibor. Um, we've taken more time than we thought we would, and actually all the blame is on me as I took 10 more minutes than planned, which are the 10 minutes missing right now, to take more questions. But we have four minutes left, and we have a few questions. And actually, the first question is for you, Tibor, on the country-by-country -country reporting statistics. When will it be publicly available? It's not the CBCR which goes public, so no big news there, just <laughs> come down, uh, everything's fine. For those not liking the idea of, of publicity or for those liking it, unfortunately, no positive answer yet. But we will publish information on the aggregated data. So when will this be available, Tibor? Um, the country-by-country -country reporting statistics will be part of the second edition of corporate tax statistics. And um, as far as I know, it will be released at um, Early 2020. Early 2020 is the answer, but we hope we can hint on what's in there in the, in the report which will be presented to G20 finance ministers in June uh, 19. So, Tibor, yeah, some more work to be done to get there. Uh, happy to share that with you at the same time as with uh, those uh, watching us. A, a question for Akim. Um, are we working on, on something like guilty at CTPA? I'm tempted to say yes and leave it at that um, <laughs> in the interest of time. But the answer is yes, we are working on, as Pascal has explained, the concept of a minimum tax and we're exploring aspects and we will certainly take into consideration and maybe informed by the uh, experience of the US with guilty, so yes. Thank you, Akim. Clear uh, cut answer. Uh, another question, and I will turn to you again, which is about uh, should one explore profit split methods for profit attribution? I will turn to Akim, but I would like uh, to make an announcement. Uh, I could have started with that, um, which is that uh, Jeff Van Hove, who joined us, I think, uh, earlier at a webcast, but who has joined the team for a few months, has now been uh, um, appointed. Uh, as uh, head of the Tax uh, Treaty and uh, Transfer Pricing unit, uh, unit, which is uh, a piece of information I wanted to share. The question would be for him, but uh, for the time being, it's for Arim. So on this first pillar, uh, as we're organized as a team to work on all these topics, uh, is it uh, about profit split? <clears throat> as Pascal has explained, there is a number of approaches that are being explored on a without prejudice basis. Um, and uh, both uh, the user participation contribution approach and the marketing intangible approach, um, when they come to not the scope, which is where they're different, but when they come to the mechanics, well, how would this implement it, are exploring forms of a residual profit split. Um, Importantly, on the marketing intangible, as the marketing intangible name suggests, it would require splitting the residual also between elements such as R&D and marketing, and then only the marketing portion of the non-routine part would be allocated to the market jurisdiction on the basis that Pascal has explained. I had actually a last question, but we have 30 seconds left. So, Tibor, that's the challenge for you. <laughs> what is the difference between forward and backward looking effective tax rates? 30 seconds. So, that's a thousand dollar question. I will try to make it as quick as possible. Um, backward looking rates are based on empirical data. So, basically, that's something that comes out of a tax return or some kind of other data source. Forward looking rates only take into account 
um, tax policy information, apply those to a hypothetical investment to isolate the effects of the tax systems. One is based on data which has been collected and, and is seen, while the other is more a simulation or modeling uh, outcome. Thanks, uh, not dollar for you, but uh, uh, some time <laughs> left uh, for us. I would like to thank the team. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we spent more time on, on the tax challenges of the digitalization of the economy, but I guess you know why. We think that uh, this is an important piece of news we had to share with you. We hope that we provided you with the instruments to understand uh, this policy note and to be able to anticipate what the public consultation document will be like in a couple of weeks uh, from now. And then we very much look forward to your contribution to the debate when we hold the public consultation mid-March. On that, I would like uh, to thank the technical team for assisting us in uh, organizing this uh, webcast, uh, the team here around the table, and uh, to you all uh, for uh, listening and watching us. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll have another one uh, sometime soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.